glad again you guys are joining us you know we just invite you into worship with us lord we just thank you that we can come and worship you today and we just pray that you will bless our time amen
Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. All right, everybody, we'll get back to worship in just a moment. But first, welcome to Convergence Community Church, where community is our middle name. We're glad you're joining us today. We are in the park every Sunday at 10 a.m., and we want to see you there. Join us at San Carlos Park and Recreation Center every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We have children's activities. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Our sermon right there is, is fresh. It's new. It's Pastor Eric without his notes, so you'll definitely want to be there because it's a lot of fun. So make sure you join us Sunday, 10 a.m. in the park. Hey, another thing, bulletin.convergencesd.com. That's our online bulletin, and it is available for you to peruse and see our worship lyrics, our sermon notes, our children's activities, our youth group activities, even our master calendar is there for you. So go to bulletin.convergencesd.com. And in fact, if you're visiting with us for the first time online today, we would love for you to go there to fill out our Connect card. It's right there at the top of the page. So please go to bulletin.convergencesd.com to do that. There are three different ways you can give at Convergence SD. You can give online at convergencesd.com. You can text your gift to 84321. Or you can mail your gift to P.O. Box 191131, San Diego, California, 92159. Our connect groups meet throughout the week, and on Tuesdays, our men and women meet at 6.30 p.m., both online and in person. And on Wednesdays, our youth group meets at 6.30 p.m., our Convergence Youth Group, and we want you to be a part of that as well. If you need more information on those uh, different connect groups, just send us an email to info at convergencesd.com. Okay, last but not least, do us a favor. Will you get out your phones? Will you check into Facebook? Because every six check-ins this month goes to providing a day of care for children in need. It's an easy way of giving back. So do us a favor and do that. Check into Facebook. Every six check-ins helps out. All right, let's pray and get back into worship. Lord, thank you again, God, for this beautiful day. We ask for a special blessing over the rest of our worship and over our sermon today. In your name, amen.
are for us and that we can go through those those hard times with you by our side.
can come and we can just celebrate it and sing it and just rejoice and just give you praise for it. Lord, that you are faithful. And we thank you and praise you for that. Amen. Our God has a design, a way things should be done. As humanity, you know, you and me, we have chosen sin and have departed God's design. But God in His goodness and grace has made a way for us to be made right, to be made whole. He has sent us good news, the gospel. We then begin this incredible pursuit of Jesus where He takes us as broken sinners and turns us into bold men and women willing to live our life on a mission. So let's begin this journey together now of what it looks like to take everyday conversations and turn them into gospel conversations. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us here online at Convergence SD. We're so glad you've chosen to join us wherever you're watching from. We'd love for you to put it in the chat so that we know uh, where you're watching from because we want to connect with you. And we have people that are uh, following along right now that would be willing to pray for you if you need prayer, so you can put that in the chat as well. And I'm sure you'd be overwhelmed by the abundance of prayer. Uh, We believe in the power of prayer, and so I want to encourage you to do that. We're in a a series right now called Tell Your Story, and uh, really my goal in this series is to help you turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. We want to teach you, encourage you, give you the tools to turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. And uh, a lot of times those conversations just come from stories, telling stories. I love a good story. You guys like stories? I love to hear a good story. Um, I I think storytelling is an art, right? That's why I work really hard to include amazing and incredible stories for you each and every week, right? Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I was just waiting for you to respond. Um, for example, I mean, <laughs> I learned so much from agriculture, so I tell stories about agriculture, like living on the Beeman farm, you know? Uh, I used to illustrate spiritual truth, which I believe Jesus did. I, Jesus used agriculture to illustrate spiritual truths all the time, the sower and the seed. He talked about uh, not not harvesting off the the weeds until the harvest comes. Uh, there's all kinds of agricultural stories. He cursed a fig tree, and so uh, I like I've shared stories like the dichotomy of death. You remember that one? Yeah. Remember that sermon? Yeah, I'm talking about compost. Don't get me started on compost. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> I love a good compost. Love the way it smells. Uh, or love vines and lilies. Do you remember that one? Yeah, I don't know if you remember the analogy there, but uh, go back and look on our YouTube page and you can find that story as well. Or how to deal with gophers. Mm. Yeah, I talk about gophers a lot. I, I, ha- I haven't told you that one? Mm. Yeah, you did. I haven't told you a story about gophers? Yeah. I'm just a, yeah. Tell us about <laughs> Well, where I live, peppermint. as you know, peppermint, yeah, peppermint and gophers, you remember that. Where I live, there's an abundance of gophers. And there's really no way to get rid of gophers. That's what I'm learning over the years. I've learned there's no way to get rid of gophers. It's just a problem that we're going to have to learn to deal with, right? I mean, I've tried everything from, like, smoke bombs to, (laughs) like, smelly poison, like poison seeds to, um, you know, different baits and, and traps and water. I've tried using water to flood them out. It doesn't work. Like, I've used these different traps to try and kill them and, and bought this really expensive one that looks like an arrow, and you stick it in the thing, and in the dirt, and it's got a thing, and, and then like the first time I tried to use it, it broke on me, right? So, um, and, and they just keep coming back, and they're really smart. Gophers are really smart. They just, like, dig around your traps. It's crazy. Gophers are just, they're just part of life. I mean, you've named it. I've tried it, and the conclusion I've come to is this. 
You ready for this? I'm ready. God made gophers for a reason. Preach. Gophers have a purpose. Did you know that? Yeah. They have a, they have a purpose. I don't really know what it is. But God made them for a reason, and they're here. And so gophers are divine. They're, they're created by God. So the solution is, at least that I've concluded, that I've come to, is that it's time to get with God's gophers. It's time to get with God's gophers. Rather than fight the divine plan of God to have gophers in this world, I've got to follow God's design. I'm going to try and understand the purpose of gophers and to live with gophers. I mean, they do aerate the soil, which is a good thing, right? They do uh, uh, eat weeds from time to time. Um, they, they feed the falcons and, and the hawks and the eagles, right? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant food for the gophers, that's what I'm, I'm going to actually plant food. I'm going to support the gophers. I'm going to plant foods that I don't like <laughs> so that they have something to eat, so they don't eat the foods that I do like. So I'm going to get with the plan, right? And, and I'm going to encourage them to aerate the soil. I'm also going to encourage more falcons hmm. and more, more, maybe even coyotes to come to eat these, these gophers um, just to keep the population. Because, you know, you can't let them get out of control. There's a natural cycle to life, right? I mean, if you've ever seen the movie... Uh, the biggest little farm. I mean, they do a great job of, of recreating this 200 acres into this, this uh, self-sufficient uh, uh, farm where, they, you know, more owls are eating the gophers. That's what they did to get the gophers. They've got ducks that are eating the snails, and they've got all this, this ecosystem that's working together in harmony. And so I'm going to try and get in harmony with God's, God's design and God's divine plan for gophers. So I'm going to... Rather than fight the divine plan for gophers, I'm going to try to follow God's design. Do you know, God loves gophers. He created them. So Moses, Jesus, and an old man were playing golf. You guys like to play golf? I love golf. I mean, what's the movie where the gopher is like eating all the, the caddyshack? Yeah, I mean, the gopher is part of golf. If you think of golf, you think of gophers. So coming up on par three, Moses has the honor. So uh, his shot, he takes a shot, but it ends up in the lake. So guess what he does? He raises his club over his head, and the lake splits, revealing <laughs> his ball on the sandy bottom. So Mo Moses walks between the halves of the lakes and chips the second shot up onto the green where it rolls into the hole for a birdie. Woohoo! Moses gets a birdie. Jesus gets up, and he tees off, and he also puts his shot in the lake. But as he approaches the lake, the ball breaks the surface of the lake. And held aloft by the tail of a fish, Jesus walks out onto the lake and hits the ball off the fish's tail, landing on the green and rolling in for a birdie, matching Moses' shot. Finally, the old man tees off. And like those before him, his shot goes, guess where? No, in the lake. In the lake. This time, however, his ball is flung out of the lake by a jumping fish. The ball lands in a tree branch and is stuck until a breeze blows Dislodging the ball from the branch, it falls into the sand trap adjacent to the green whereupon a gopher pushes it out of the sand trap and onto the green with enough momentum to roll into the hole for a hole in one, besting both Moses and Jesus. So Jesus rolls his eyes and says, Dad, stop playing games. <laughs> You didn't think the old man was going to make it in the hole, did you? How is he going to beat Jesus? Only with the help of his father. That's right. See, we're all in desperate need of the divine. We all find ourselves in desperate need of help from God, whether we're dealing with gophers or we're dealing with people, whether we're dealing with uh, whatever life might throw you, financial situations, a, a physical heart hardship, or uh, uh, some kind of... Uh, personal or relational distress, we're all in need, and we're in desperate need of the divine. And so rather than fight against all of these issues and these struggles that we have in life, rather than fight the divine, we should get with the design. It's part of our fallen nature, however, to fight against all these things, isn't it? Not just to fight it, but 
if you really read scripture, we know it's to, to replace it with our own plan. Rather than seek out the answers to life from the divine, we take it upon ourselves to come up with the answers. How do I answer questions about abortion? How do I answer questions about homosexuality? How do I answer questions about why evil exists in the world? Right? These are all questions that many atheists actually struggle with when they think about God. How do I answer questions about the platypus? Like why? Why platypus? Or what about giraffes and how long their necks are? Like really? Why? And how? Or the Moloch horridus? Or the New Zealand weeda? Right? Or, or even gophers? Wait, you guys haven't heard about the mollusk horida? Or the weeda? The mollusk corrida is like one of the, it's called the, I think it's called the devil lizard. And it lives in the desert and it literally drinks water from its feet. Oh, I've seen that. Is that crazy? And he's got horns all over him and he drinks water from his feet. It's crazy. Like, why did God create that? How did God create that? That's crazy. Or the weeda, the New Zealand weeda. It's like this little grasshopper slash cricket looking thing. Actually, it's not little. It's about this big. And it literally freezes to death. To death. Like it. Its heart stops, like it, it, just, it just stops completely. It dies in the wintertime and then comes back to life when the thaw comes. Is that cool? Is that crazy? That God, why would God create that? Or how did God create that? What are the answers to these questions? Here's the problem. Devil wants you to try and figure it out on your own, apart from the divine. But remember our theme verse for this series is 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. You don't have to have all the answers. Just be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. But first and foremost, we should honor God. Honor Christ the Lord as holy. In other words, acknowledge that there is something greater than ourselves a wisdom greater than our own, that his ways are greater than my ways. Acknowledge the divine in our lives. And then just be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. We don't always have to have all the answers. We just have to share our story and then point them to God. And it's really easy because everyone, not just you, not just me, but everyone we meet is in desperate need of the divine. And when we can tell a story of our hope that we put in, our, in God, we can turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. Here's the problem. We do it all the time, even as pastors. We try to come up with the answers, right? Our churches are full of it. I'm, 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 I'm guilty of it. We think, how can we dress up God? How can we dress up the gospel? How can we dress up worship? What can we do? I mean, more lights, more cameras, right? You know, a, a different worship style, like more electric guitar, less electric guitar, more drums, less drums. What can we do to dress up the gospel and worship so that people will find him attractive as if God is not attractive enough as it is? And that's one of the things we've said here since day one is we believe that Jesus Christ is the most attractive thing on the planet. And so we want to invite the spirit of God to come and be present. But I, I, I'll be honest, I'm guilty of it. I think about it from time to time. Our churches are full of it, including ours. But all this really does is not just simplify, but it muddles the greatest story ever told. Like the story of God isn't enough on its own. Like my gopher stories could ever be more entertaining than the story of God. I mean. But what if we just like were to share and read scripture? And let's the scripture do the storytelling for us. What if we, we got back to God's divine plan for gophers and for your life and for my life? Or better yet, God's divine plan for all of his people. What if we just read the greatest story ever told? So I'd like to, you know, I'd like to do that today. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. 
and just to kind of help you get in the mindset if you if you understand the creation story and and really the three circles that you know once once again another another kind of cool tricky kind of weird interesting way to help us remember the greatest story ever told the three circles you and I were created in the image of God but we've fallen from that image but God had a plan to redeem us and restore us through his his son Jesus Christ who came to earth lived a sinless life died on the cross rose again on the third day and then ascended into heaven sent the Holy Spirit to begin the restoration process in you and in me to restore us to the image in which we were created you like that? I mean, that's, that's kind of cute. It really simplifies the gospel because we know that the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is so much more than that. But at least it gives us a place to start. And really, the best place to start is in the book of Genesis and the idea that you and I were created in the image of God. So we're in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 4. I wish I had like a flannel graph or something creative, but I don't. <laughs> I'm just going to read... <laughs> I do too. I'm just going to read from God's Word the story. And it's a little long, so I'd encourage you to get your Bible out and follow along with me. But it was meant to be read in this way. It's a story. Verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in the Eden and in the east and there had there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first was the Fishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. The Delian and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you, sh you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And now out of the, garden, out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds in the of the heavens and, so, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called the woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's how it was in the beginning. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is, at this point, this is the way it was intended to be. Man and woman in the garden. Only one rule. What's the rule? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is for their consumption. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the tree of the, uh, or the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that, there, that, the, tree, that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Interesting, God's walking in the cool of the day in the garden. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Verse 17, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 20, And the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for man Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and clothe them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of, from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the beginning of the story of humankind. The greatest story really ever told. And I'm sure as I read through it, many of you that have heard this preached on, had pastors preach on, there's certain, certain parts of it that pop. Maybe it was God walking in the garden. Maybe it was the name given to Eve. Maybe it was Satan's interaction, the serpent's interaction with Eve. I find it interesting that what is it that the serpent said to Eve? Basically, he said, For God knows, verse 5 of chapter 3, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, you and I, were, we were created in the garden, in the image of God, chapter 1 tells us. You and I were created in the image of God, both male and female. He created them. But we were created even more than that. We were created for community. We were created for community with one another. God said it's not good for us to be alone. We were also created for community with God, relationship with God. But we've fallen from that fellowship. We've fallen from that community because we've taken the deity out of the divine. We've taken the deity and set him aside and made ourselves like God, just as the serpent deceived Eve. He said, the only reason that God doesn't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because you'll become like God. And he wasn't wrong. But we were never meant to be God. We were made in the image of God, but never meant to be God. We are never meant to take God out of the picture. He's always supposed to be part of our lives. The word divine actually comes from the Latin word, 
which literally means of or belonging to God. You and I, were divine. We're created in the image of God. We're of God. We're part of God. But the word deity also comes from the Latin, means divine nature or godhood, attributes of God. Deity is something different than what is divine. In fact, the only time we see the word deity translated in Scripture is in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And it's interesting that it, Paul uses it to help us understand our relationship with God and with Jesus. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, Colossians chapter 2. Start in verse 8. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. We just saw that, didn't we? Philosophy and empty deceit deceived Eve. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells. There's that word, deity. The whole fullness of God. In other words, Christ was God, is God. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, but by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all, of our trespasses. See, Paul makes it very clear that yes, Eve was deceived and we are often deceived. What does he say? By philosophy and empty deceit. But he makes it clear that Jesus being God in the flesh is the solution. He's the answer. He is the deity. You see, Satan deceived us into taking the deity out of the divine. But Paul made it clear that Jesus came to bring the deity back into the divine. Paul uses the Greek word here, theotis, which means the state of being God to describe Christ. It's the only time that's used in Scripture. And it points to the fact that Jesus wasn't just like God. He was God. He was the fullness of God. You and I were created for community, but we've fallen from fellowship because we've taken the deity out of the divine. We've taken the deity out of our divine nature. We've set it aside. We've taken God out of the story. The greatest story ever told. We've taken God out of it and created our own story. We're writing our own story. And as so many of us have experienced already, when we write our own story, we find ourselves at the dead end. We find ourselves in desperate need of the divine. But the beautiful thing is that's not the end of the story. You see, as I said before, God sent Jesus Christ. He came in the flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again, paid the penalty for our sins, but not just paid the penalty, he rose again showing he had power over sin and death itself. And then ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to come and begin the restoration process within us. You see, the divine is with us, or the deity is with us. It's been reestablished and, re and put back into the story of the divine. Our divine lives. The Holy Spirit's with us. God is with us wherever we find ourselves. He's restoring us to that original image in which we were created in the Garden of Eden. So I don't know where you're at. I don't know where, what you're going through, but I can assume that like many of us, you've come up to a dead end. Maybe you're struggling with a physical ailment or financial hardship. Maybe it's a relational issue that you find yourself against. And you're trying to find the answers. And it's not cliche for me to say that Jesus is the answer. It's through Jesus that we put the deity back into the divine. Maybe it's time for you to get back to the story of God, the true story of God. 
Maybe it's time for you to get back to God's original design. It's time to put the deity back into the divine. I'm going to ask the worship team to come as I close. Here's what I've learned as a pastor, as a Christian, as I've studied the greatest story ever told. I found that you don't have to have all the answers all the time. You just have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lives within you. Let God do the rest. John tells us that it's the Father that draws people unto Christ, unto, Christ, unto himself. It's that people don't come unto the Father except that he calls them, that he draws them. And we just get to be part of the story. What a beautiful thing. We don't have to know all the answers. But if you want to turn your everyday conversations into gospel conversations, you just have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. What has God done in your life? How are you putting the deity back into the divine? That's how you turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. Just be ready to tell your story and let God tell his. Well, who do I tell it to? Well, we talk a lot around here about oikos, that 8 to 15, as Tom Mercer puts it, that 8 to 15 people that God is both supernaturally, notice God's involved in that whole process, God is both supernaturally and strategically placed in your immediate sphere of influence. Last week I asked you to write their names on one of these, one of these oikos cards. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. Go to our website, you can download one. Begin praying for those that oikos, begin praying for your oikos, those 8 to 15 people that God has put in your life supernaturally. Because there's a plan and a purpose for every single one of them. There's a plan and a purpose for every single detail of your life, even the gophers. Right? God has a plan for gophers in your life. So rather than fight the divine, let's work together to get with his design. Sometimes the plan or the purpose of trials in your life are just to remind you of your desperate need for the divine. Maybe you're in, in desperate need for the divine today. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Reach out to him. Just say a quick prayer, God, I need you in my life today. I need you to be a part of my life. I need to, to reintroduce you to my life as if he didn't already know. Simply invite him back into your life today. Father, that's my prayer for each and every one of us today in this room, watching online, wherever we find ourselves, whatever stage of life we're in, whatever challenges we're facing. Whatever questions we're faced with today, may we look to you. May we put the deity back into the divine plan that you have for us today. And may we be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. So Lord, help us not to find creative ways to tell your story, but to be all about letting you tell your story through us. So give us insight and wisdom to that. And Lord, we're just thankful that you're present with us. We're thankful that you've made a way for you to be with us through the power of your spirit. So we pray you'd have your way with us even now as we close in this prayer and in this song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the vine.
we could ever breathe.
think if I had to pick, this is probably going to be my favorite series of, of, of this year, just because it's, the title is Tell Your Story. And it's one of those things that I believe in. The power of my story, the power of my testimony is one that nobody can argue with because it's what God's brought me through. It's what God's done in my life. It's, it, it's how God's healed me. It's how God's shown me. He is my God. He is my Father. And I think as you, as you get into this, as you dig into the series, and as you talk about how to share God's love with your, with your immediate oikos and those around you, whether it be at work or whatever, think about just talk about what God's done for you. That's the gospel. That's your gospel. It's your story. How God's working in your life. How he's changed the things. How he's healed you. How he's brought you from this to this. And so as you go forth and as you talk about this and as you tell your story, as you share God, share what he's done with you. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to share your testimony. Speak the truth of what God's done in your life. Father God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you so much for seeing us worthy to sing your son and die for us, God. But in that, we get to tell our story. We get to speak your truth in our lives and, and, and make it whole. We make it genuine. We make it tangible. We make what you've done for your son to die for us and how it's changed our lives, God. We get to talk about that. We get to share with an excitement. We get to share it with with compassion, we get to share it to where it makes us cry. We get to share it to where we rejoice and understand, Father, what you've done. If we're truly wanting to, to spread your word and spread your life and, and talk about you, then let's talk about what we've done. Allow us to use what we what you've done in us, God. Those broken and flawed and things that that we we hold on to that you're fixing. You're turning into to strength, God. The things that you say, I see that, my son, but I love you anyway. I see that, my daughter, but I love you anyway. I see that, and I sent my son to die for you anyway. Go shout on the mountains. Go shout in the valleys. Go shout my gospel and what I've done in your life. Father, we thank you so much. And in your son's name we pray. Have a blessed weekend.